This passage, I think, is very current for the situation we find ourselves in today, yet it was written in 1978. It's part of um, the Kramer et al. publication that we will hear lots about today. But I think this kind of shows what a visionary statement in a way it was. If we look at the situation for food contact materials, for example, we use more than 4,000 substances in food contact materials today. And there's maybe for a third or less than those 4,000 substances, actual toxicological testing data available to evaluate the safety of the use of these substances in contact with food. I think that's an interesting figure in itself. But then we take a step further and we look at the very hot topic of NIAS, the non-intentionally added substances, which are impurities, which are breakdown products of additives or the polymer, and maybe also reaction byproducts of food contact material manufacture and use. And there we are dealing with an unknown number of substances. So these are what Rumsfeld would call the unknown unknowns. And for most of these, there is no toxicological data available either. So in this situation, I think the threshold of toxicological concern is a very useful and needed tool. It's a, it's a concept that comes in very handy here. So the aim of our day today is to understand what is the TTC? What is the science underlying this concept, which is very useful? What are the key assumptions that are being made and what are their scientific justifications from a perspective of 2013, not going back to the starting, startings of the TTC? So, where did it all start? This is a, a timeline chart that my colleague Birgit Goeke um, produced and it just gives you an idea of how old the idea of TTC actually is. It goes back 46 years, 1967. I won't go into all the details just now, but we'll go step by step. So what actually sparked the initial idea? This was even further back in 1958, the Food and Drug Amendment Act. Now this amendment in, in the US law included a provision that all indirect food additives, so substances that are present in food contact materials and that can migrate into food, must be tested for their safety. And at the time, that meant doing animal tests, two-year chronic toxicity studies, very expensive, a lot of effort. Now, of course, this was a big challenge to the manufacturers of food contact materials, and there was um, an acceptance that, of course, you, you only look for the substances that you can actually detect, so the, the ones that, that migrate and you can measure that. Um, that's a, a limit that has changed over the years, obviously, with innovation and, and analytical chemistry. In 1967, J.P. Frawley of Hercules Incorporated, a chemical manufacturer in the U.S., published a paper called Scientific Evidence and Common Sense as a basis for food packaging regulations. And he proposed this threshold for safety testing based on an analysis of 220 substances for which he had chronic feeding data. And he looked at the no effect levels from these chronic feeding studies and he developed the idea that there's a probability distribution for, for these substances to have a no effect level within a certain range. And he found that the probability of a substance having a no effect level below this proposed threshold was very low. So he said, okay, if we have an unknown substance, we have no toxic data for that substance, the probability that it causes an effect below 100 ppm is very low. That was the start of, of the TTC idea, actually. Of course, he, he excluded some groups, heavy metals and pesticides. Then in 1995, the FDA um, got a new rule called the threshold of regulation. And that actually goes back to this idea by Frawley that there is a probability distribution for um, uh, unknown chemicals to cause an effect at a certain threshold. 
FDA set that threshold at 0.5 ppb. So that's four orders of magnitude below what Frawley proposed 30 years earlier. So that, of course, already gives you an indication of how much analytical um, detection uh, sensitivity increased over those, over those decades. And it's interesting or important to note here that um, carcinogens uh, are, were considered the most severe toxic effect and, and so they were excluded or are excluded from the, t the threshold of regulation TOR concept. This rule is still in effect today in the US, it's being used. The basis for the TOR, and this is the first complicated slide I have, um, all the other complicated details I leave to the next speakers, but this is my task to explain this to you now. So here you see a typical probability distribution. These are data points from chronic carcinogenicity studies done in rodents, where three um, groups were, were used, so control group, half maximum tolerated dose and maximum tolerated dose, and then it was estimated what the dose was to cause cancer in 50% of the test animals. So it's what, what is called the TD50, the tumorigenic dose 50. And so it's a probability of one in two that at any of these given concentrations, you will have cancer in your test animal. And so on the, uh, the y-axis here, you can see the number of carcinogens that were found um, after analyz analyzing a database of about 450 substances. And on the x-axis, this is a little bit complicated, I'll just explain it, it's the potency index. So on the left, you have the most toxic substances, where you have the lowest TD50, so the lowest dose to cause cancer in 50% of your animals. And on the right here, you have the weakest, the least toxic substances. And, and this is the probability distribution. Now what scientists working at the FDA, and that's Alan Rulis and others did, was they extrapolated this to the human situation. So they set an acceptable risk for cancer incidence in the human population of one in a million. This is one in two. They divided these data by 500,000 and then they got the same distribution, just here the x-axis changed and then they said, okay, here this is the dietary concentration, 0.5 ppb and the probability of an unknown chemical increasing the cancer risk of one in a million at a dietary intake of 0.5 ppb is 37%. In other words, you're, you have a certainty of 63% that an unknown chemical will not increase the risk of cancer in your human population. Right? Okay, I'm looking at my colleague because... <laughs> carcinogens. Carcinogens. Yes, only carcinogens, yeah, yeah, exactly, thanks. So I think what's interesting here for me, um, I'm not, uh, I haven't worked on chronic carcinogenicity, I've worked on other endpoints. There were no safety factors used to extrapolate from the animal data to the human data. That's one point that I just want to make here. It's common for this type of um, carcinogenicity assessment. Now, let's jump to the next really important development in the TTC and it's actually jumped back on the timeline to 1978. This is the famous Kramer et al. publication where an estimation of toxic hazard decision tree approach was published. Kramer et al. had the idea to say, okay, probability distribution, good idea. Let's add another dimension. Let's look at the two-dimensional chemical structure and they developed a decision tree based on 33 questions and they took a chemical substance and ran it through this, this decision tree looking at functional groups, looking at you know chemical structure and so on and then based on these questions placed it in one of three Kramer classes with different thresholds again. The thresholds that Kramer et al were looking at were still in the PPM range a little bit lower than Frawley's proposal, but still, I think from our today's perspective, pretty high. And they called this an index of suspicion. So they didn't say this is 
a replacement for toxicological hazard assessment, but it, it's kind of, you know, we, we have a whole bunch of chemicals, we don't have the resources to test all of them right now, so how do we sort out the really important ones? How do we identify the ones that, that are of serious concern versus the ones that are of very much less concern? So it, it's, for them it was a tool to prioritise. And what they also clearly say in, in the publication, which is really interesting to read, they say that these questions are based on the available data about metabolism and toxicity of, of substances. So available data meaning at the time, 1978. And now finally the highlight, um, the threshold of toxicological concern, the concept developed by Ian Munro and colleagues in 1996, based on Frawley's ideas, based on Kramer's ideas. What Munro did, just very briefly, um, he, or he and his colleagues took 613 data points from chronic toxicity testing, subchronic reproductive and teratogenicity testing, and took the no observed effect levels, the no Ls, no Ls, and ran them through the Kramer decision tree and did a Kramer classification, placed them into one of three classes. And here again, you see structure class one is, I always get this wrong, least concern, right, Birgit? And, stru and structure class three is of highest concern. So you can see his 600 and something substances were, were placed in these three classes. And then, this is what was, was innovative by uh, Munro et al they made a cumulative distribution. So they took the NOAL of a substance and placed it in a kind of drawer, in a range where the NOAL would be, and then they took the next NOAL, placed it in the same range, and so on, until they had covered all substances from one class. And so this is what you see here. I know these look a lot like dose-response curves. So the toxicologist will I always thought at the beginning this is a dose response curve. It's not. It's a cumulative distribution. Um, here you have the percentage. So the way to read this, this chart is at 100%, all substances from class one, uh, sorry, class three, you have at least, you have all NOAA Ls of these substances at fi around 500 milligram per kilogram body weight or below. And so 50% of the substances in this class one will have a NOAA L, which is below 10 milligram per kilogram body weight, and so on. That's how to read this chart. It's a probability, and not, it's a mixture of probability distribution and the, the NOAA L. And so what they then did was they said, okay, let's make a cutoff. We want to have 95% of all substances um, should, should be safe. The, the, so they drew this red line here. These are 5% of the substances below the red line, 95 above. And where the red line <laughs> intersects with these three curves, that's where our thresholds of toxicological concern are. And here you, you can see them. Um, what Kramer and uh, what Manra, sorry, and colleagues then did was to extrapolate these data, their animal data to the human situation. They made various assumptions to do that. For one, they assumed th that humans ha are weigh 60 kilograms, so you get from, from <coughs> kilogram per body weight to kilogram per person. That's a standard assumption. Um, and then they also assumed a safety factor because animals aren't people and people aren't people of 100. And so these finally are our thresholds of toxicological concern for human exposure to unknown chemicals through food. <coughs> now, there were a few modifications made to the TTC over the years. Um, in 2004, uh, Cruz et al. proposed to um, introduce two additional thresholds, one for genotoxic carcinogens and 
one for a special group of chemicals, carbamates and organophosphates, and they also excluded some, some classes of compounds from using in the TTC due to their known toxicity and, and risks for human exposure. And then in 2012, and I'm so pleased that EFSA is here today, <laughs> Claudia Hepner representing EFSA. I'm sure she will talk about the EFSA scientific opinion that was published in, in July 2012, or not, maybe, <laughs> um, where the suggestion was made, you know, Kramer class 2 is just an intermediate class, let's get rid of it. Let's move the substances from Kramer class 2 into Kramer class 3. So add a little more um, conservativeness there and also excluding further chemical categories. And the one I just want to highlight here is the mixtures of unknown chemical structures, which is of course relevant when we look at NIAS migrating from food contact materials. Just to finish off, I think I'm in good time. Um, this is from EFSA's scientific opinion publication, a, a chart adopted again by my colleague Birgit Goike. A decision tree, you can't read the details uh, in the back, but it just tells you the steps you have to take to decide uh, if your substance um, that you have measured in food at a certain level presents a risk to human health or not, based, based on, on the TTC. And with that, I would like to wish us all a thought-provoking, inspiring and and fruitful day and I look forward to learning so much from all of you and thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>